Sir, we'll proceed off. Yes, yes, proceed. So, yeah, summarize the classification. Yeah, continue with it. Uh, atonic seizures. Uh, as the name suggests, there is sudden loss of postural muscle tone lasting for one to two seconds. Consciousness is briefly impaired. There is usually no post ictal confusion. Can range from quick head drop or nodding movement to even collapse, what we call as drop attacks. There will be brief generalized spike and wave discharges followed by followed immediately by diffuse slow waves that correlate with the loss of muscle tone. Atonic seizures may be associated with uh, epilepsy syndromes like Lennox Gustav syndrome. Myoclonic seizures, uh, sudden and brief muscle contractions uh, that may involve one part of the body or the entire body. There are physiological forms of uh, uh, myoclonic jerks like sudden jerking movements observed while falling asleep. And there are pathological forms which can be associated with metabolic disorders, degenerative CNS disease, or anoxic brain injury. There will be bilaterally synchronous spike and slow wave discharges immediately prior to the movement. Uh, myoclonic seizures can coexist with other forms of generalized seizures. It's the predominant feature of a juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. And we have epileptic spasms. These are briefly sustained flexion or extension of predominantly proximal muscles. It is common in infants. EEG can show diffuse giant slow waves with a chaotic background of irregular multifocal spikes and sharp waves. During the clinical spasm, there is marked uh, su suppression of the EEG background, which we call as the electro uh, decremental response. Uh, electromyography can show rhomboid pattern. It helps to differentiate between a brief tonic and myoclonic seizures. Moving on to juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. Uh, onset is usually early adolescence. There will be bilateral myoclonic jerks, which can be a single event or repetitive. It is most frequent in the morning after uh, awakening. It can be provoked by sleep deprivation. It is a generalized seizure. The cause is uh, usually not known. Uh, there will be family history. It is polygenic. Uh, consciousness is usually preserved. Uh, GTCS or absent seizures can coexist, but usually as a good outcome. Um, these are the definitive criteria for diagnostic criteria for juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. Seizures are usually myoclonic seizures. Three point three to five point five hertz generalized spike wave or a generalized poly spike uh, wave on EEG can be seen. Uh, again, an MRI is not required for diagnosis and ictal EEG is not required for diagnosis. Moving on to uh, some developmental uh, uh, seizure syndromes, uh, Lennox Gustav syndrome. Uh, usually, it is a uh, tonic seizures. In addition to tonic seizures, at least one additional seizure type uh, must be present, which includes a uh, atypical seizures, atonic seizures, myoclonic seizures, or focal seizures with impaired awareness, or generalized tonic-clonic seizures, or non-convulsive status epilepticus, or epileptic spasms can be present. EEG shows uh, generalized uh, slow spike and wave complexes of less than 2.5 hertz, or generalized paroxysmal fast activity during sleep. Uh, usually, the age of onset is less than 18 years. It, uh, most of the uh, syndromes are complex, they are drug resistant, uh, they can be associated with mild to profound um, intellectual disability. Uh, MRI is not required for diagnosis, but is usually performed to evaluate the underlying etiology, like mainly to rule out. Uh, ictal EEG is again not required for diagnosis, however, it should be strongly considered in a child with alerts or with uh, Clinical features that may suggest epilepsy with the myoclonic uh, atonic seizure syndrome. Uh, Dravet syndrome. Again, it is again a developmental seizure uh, syndrome. There can be uh, there will be recurrent uh, focal clonic uh, seizures. It can be febrile and afebrile. Uh, age of onset is usually uh, one to twenty months. Again, it is drug resistant and there will be associated intellectual disability. Again, MRI is not required for diagnosis, but is routinely performed to exclude other causes. And ictal EEG is again not required for 
diagnosis moving on to mesial temporal lobe epilepsy with hippocampal sclerosis so there will be focal uh, seizures with awareness or impaired awareness with the initial semiology referable to the medial temporal lobe uh, on imaging uh, here mri is uh, Uh, required for diagnosis where we can pick up uh, hippocampal sclerosis uh, again ital eeg is not required for diagnosis and then we have familial mesial temporal lobe epilepsy again we are we have focal uh, cognitive sensory or autonomic uh, seizures here uh, the uh, imaging can be normal or hippocampal atrophy or sclerosis is often present Uh, there will be family history of individuals with the focal seizures that arise from the mesial temporal lobe. That is the difference. MRI is again required to exclude other causes here, uh, which is different from uh, mesial temporal lobe epilepsy with hippocampal sclerosis. And ictal EEG is again not required for diagnosis. So in short, for all these epilepsy syndromes, the concept is basically the same. When should you suspect a syndromic epilepsy? One, the onset is very early. So as uh, we are discussing about the age of onset, any seizure in one to five years of age, the first differential diagnosis should be febrile seizures. But febrile seizures have a particular characteristic. Suppose a febrile seizure lasting more than five years of age, there is a family history of seizure. A uh, child is having multiple types of epilepsy in the same patient. Usually, uh, Suppose uh, adult is having GTCS, every time they develop seizure, they'll have only GTCS. But patients with syndromic epilepsy, they can have all types of seizure. They occur in different points of time. So the same patient may present GTCS at one time, atonic seizure at other time. So multiple types of seizure in the same patient. And uh, uh, atypical EEG findings. Like EEG also, you don't have a particular finding. There'll be multiple different findings. So family history, early age of onset, multiple seizure types and refractory epilepsy. So these points should help us to think that it could be a syndromic epilepsy. In syndromic epilepsy, MRI is important because uh, as he was mentioning, we have a familial mesial temporal lobe epilepsy, uh, mesial temporal lobe epilepsy, hippocampal sclerosis. So most of the syndromes can have some changes in MRI. So a pediatric epilepsy or a syndromic epilepsy, MRI is needed either to rule out other causes or to rule in Uh, mesial temporal lobe epilepsy and all. EEG is not required, but MRI may be required in their cases. Again, there's another concept called as genetic causes of epilepsy. Uh, there's a slide on that also. Uh, some channel mutations can cause epilepsy. For example, SCN1A mutation is one mutation which can cause epilepsy. So even though it's a complicated one, why you should know the basic genetics and why you should know the basic uh, concept is uh, Regarding treatment, carbamazepine, oxcarbamazepine, phenytoin, these are sodium channel blockers. Patient with SCN1A mutation, we cannot give phenytoin. We cannot give carbamazepine. So, some basic genetic knowledge. Okay, so continue. Uh, so, your observational points quoted in Arison. Uh, there are differences between individuals in the susceptibility and threshold for uh, seizures. And uh, different seizure thresholds uh, at a different uh, maturation stages uh, uh, can be there. Any CNS injury like stroke infections uh, can disturb the normal neural architecture and uh, make them hyper excitable. That is epileptogenic. Mm, seizures are mo mostly episodic. Any physiological or physical stress including sleep deprivation or hormonal changes or certain exogenous factors can act as the precipitant for these uh, susceptible individuals. Uh, causes can also so be was trying to tell based is, on the age. What you are trying to tell is, we have uh, four points to think. Whenever a patient comes with seizures, we have predisposing factors, epileptogenic factors, provocative or precipitating factors. So predisposing factors, family history, any childhood history of febrile seizure, uh, earlier aura, all these are called as predisposing factors. So any patient with a family history, they're already predisposed for epilepsy. So that is called pre the susceptibility or the predisposing factor. Epileptogenic factors, anything which can trigger epilepsy in a 
predisposed or non predisposed individual for example stroke is an epileptogenic factor head injury brain tumor av malformation these are epileptogenic factor so one definition of epilepsy says that epilepsy is two unprovoked seizures or one unprovoked seizure with high risk of recurrence so what determines that recurrence is the presence of any epileptogenic factor like head injury stroke uh, to port numbers head injury has 1.5 to 17 times increased risk of stroke in the next one year okay so head injury is a epileptogenic factor stroke also has 17 times increased risk a depressed fracture like head injury with a depressed fracture has a high risk of seizure so predisposition is family history epileptogenic is any structural injury which can predispose to high risk of seizure third thing is called as provocative factors so i was also mentioning one point in seizure we have provoked seizures and unprovoked seizures so even in a patient who is predisposed presence of any uh, acid base abnormality electrolyte imbalance hypoglycemia hyperglycemia any infection alcohol or drugs all these can cause they, they can provoke seizure okay so predisposing factors epileptogenic factors provocative factors and we have something called as precipitating factors for example sleep disturbance is a precipitating factor sleep uh, emotional disturbance is a precipitating factor menstruation is a precipitating factor some people they, they present seizures during uh, menses that's called as catamenial epilepsy fever is a precipitating factor hyperventilation is a precipitating factor for absence seizures okay so remember these four terms uh, predisposing factor epileptogenic factor provocative factor and uh, precipitating factor predisposing factors we cannot change it is familiar epileptogenic factor presence of any epileptogenic factor is an indication to start anti epileptic drug for example depressed fracture tumor stroke etc <clears throat> like not all stroke some types of stroke like a hem focal hemorrhagic stroke provocative factors has to be ruled out in any seizure any electrolyte imbalance acid base imbalance sugar values coexisting infection including meningitis and intake of any drugs including alcohol precipitating factors they don't have a separate treatment as such but we have to give advice to them to avoid in emotional stress uh, to avoid sleep deprivation to be careful during menses okay so these four points are important these are from maths next slide and this slide is also important uh, like Based on, the age, based on age, yeah. uh, in neonates less than one month, uh, perinatal hypoxia and dyspnea, intracranial hemorrhage or trauma, any CNS infections, metabolic disturbances like hypoglycemia, hypocalcemia, hypomagnesemia, pyridoxine deficiency, any drug withdrawal, developmental disorders and genetic disorders should be considered. In infants and children, less than 12 years, febrile seizures. Uh, genetic disorders like metabolic degenerative and primary epilepsy syndromes again cns infections developmental disorders and trauma repeat answer in adolescence between 12 to 18 years trauma uh, genetic disorders infections illicit drug use and even brain tumors should be suspected in young adults between 18 to 35 years again trauma alcohol withdrawal or illicit drug abuse uh, or brain tumor or even auto antibodies can be a cause in older adults more than 35 years cerebral vascular disease uh, brain tumors alcohol withdrawal metabolic disorders like uremic uh, uh, failure or hepatic failure or nuclear disturbances uh, hypoglycemia hyperglycemia should be considered alzheimer's disease and other degenerative cns disease can also be caused uh, and auto antibody should be considered so that slide is again a very very important slide okay so neon less than one at least remember the two causes in each category less than one month of age first thing is perinatal hypoxia and perinatal hypoxia itself is a predisposing factor of intracranial hemorrhage or trauma in neonates and i was telling you one to five years of age febrile seizure is most common but febrile seizure should follow a typical pattern if uh, febrile seizure is atypical there is family history then think of genetic disorders which arvind was telling uh, in much detail 12 to 18 years comes under adult uh, medicine so 12 to 18 years or 18 to 15 years remember the first most important cause of seizure is trauma so why this point is important is assume a patient who comes to you with uh, acute alcohol he is unconscious or uh, he is drowsy uh, attendants give a history of seizure 
in settings where uh, uh, manpower personnel is not available like in uh, small government hospitals the tendency is to treat them like acute alcohol intoxication giving them time in fluids etc and sending them home that's a wrong practice because even in young adults 80 to 35 years trauma is still the leading most cause of seizures so even if there is an uh, coexistent alcohol intake don't label vernic encephalopathy or alcohol as the sole cause of seizures that could be underlying trauma they have become unconscious they have sustained an sdh so any patient who comes to a seizure especially in 12 to 35 years imaging is very important ct is the first imaging of choice when it comes to more than 35 years rule out a cv cv a brain tumor and last will be autoimmune encephalitis okay so this is a very important uh, uh, slide this is also taken from nice anthony we want to surprise seizures these are seizures associated with fever but uh, without evidence of cns infection or other different causes it is the most common seizure arising in uh, late infancy and early uh, childhood the peak years is between 3 months to 5 years or even 18 months to 24 months uh, you to be more specific uh, family history of febrile seizures or epilepsy is often present Uh, it is usually seen in the rising phase of the temperature curve they are generalized tonic clonic seizures uh, common childhood infections such as otitis media respiratory infections or gastroenteritis can be the underlying cause for fever uh, recurrences are common in about one third of the patient especially when it occurs early part of like within one year of life febrile seizures can be classified broadly into simple febrile seizures and complex febrile seizures simple febrile seizures are single isolated event they are brief uh, they are symmetric in appearance there is no risk of developing epilepsy in future complex febrile seizures they are repeated seizure activity the duration is uh, can be more than 15 minutes can be associated with focal features Uh, they have a slightly increased risk, about 2 to 5 percent of developing epilepsy. Uh, moving on to certain drugs causing the epilepsy. Uh, alkylating agents like busulfone or chloramucil can cause. Anti-malarias like chloroquine or mefloquine. Uh, antimicrobials like beta-lactams, quinolones. acyclovir antivirals like acyclovir isoniazid and gancyclovir can cause anesthetic agents and analgesics like mepiridine fentanyl tramadol local anesthetics and certain uh, dietary supplements can also cause immunomodulatory drugs like cyclosporin tacrolimus interferons psychotropic drugs like antidepressants bupropion antipsychotics like clozapine mood stabilizers like lithium and uh, radiographic contrast agents and certain drug withdrawal like alcohol baclofen and uh, barbiturates and benzodiazepines zolpidem can all cause seizures uh, drugs of abuse like amphetamine cocaine benzocaine methylphenidate can all cause seizures moving on to pathophysiology uh, there is seizure initiation and seizure propagation uh, initiation is caused by intense near simultaneous firing of a large number of local excitatory neurons resulting in an apparent uh, hypersynchronization of the excitatory fibers across a relatively large cortical area uh, it begins with influx of extracellular calcium which again causes opening of voltage gated sodium channels this uh, generates uh, action potential uh, this is responsible for all these calcium uh, excess like calcium uh, channels voltage gated uh, sodium channels are responsible for uh, uh, long lasting depolarization and opening of uh, gaba or potassium channel uh, that is hyperpolar that causes hyperpolarization uh, propagation propagation is caused by recruitment of surrounding neurons via a number of synaptic and non synaptic me- mechanisms including uh, an increase in extracellular potassium which blunts the hyperpolarization uh, polarization and depolarizes the neighboring neurons 
or accumulation of calcium in the presynaptic terminals uh, leading to an enhanced uh, neurotransmitter release which can cause propagation uh, depolarization induced activation of nmda subtype of uh, excited amino uh, acid receptor can again cause additional calcium influx and neuronal activation or uh, aphatic interactions related to changes in tissue osmolarity and cell swelling can also be a mechanism for seizure propagation excitatory currents propagate into contiguous area via local uh, cortical connections and into more distant areas via long commercial pathways such as uh, the corpus callosum uh, moving on to epileptogenesis which we already discussed it refers to the transformation of a normal neuronal network into one that is chronically hyper excitable Uh, the time range which it takes can vary from months to years from an initial injury to a clinically evident seizure uh, as sir was mentioning certain genes involved in epilepsy uh, most of them are channelopathies uh, dravet syndrome is associated with uh, again sodium channel uh, sodium channelopathy and benign familial uh, neonatal seizures can be associated with uh, potassium channelopathy uh, juvenile uh, myoclonic seizures again uh, most of the seizure symptoms can have uh, uh, genes involved uh, coming on to the anti seizure medications based on their mechanism action uh, sodium channel inhibitors phenytoin carbamazepine uh, lamotrigine topiramate zonisamide flaxosamide rutinamide or sinobamide uh, inhibition of calcium channels again uh, phenytoin carbapentin pregabalin uh, voltage gated calcium channels inhibition of uh, t type calcium channels ethosuximide and uh, valproic acid Uh, attenuation of glutamate activity we have uh, lamotrigine topiramate felpamate and uh, parampanal mm. and drugs causing uh, modulation in the release of synaptic vesicles we have levetiracetam and brevaracetam and uh, drugs facilitating the opening of potassium channels we have isocarbine and we have drugs causing potentiation of the gaba receptor that is benzodiazepines and barbiturates and uh, drugs uh, cause increasing the availability of gaba we have uh, valproic acid gaba pentin and tiagabin uh, and uh, cannabidiol uh, is uh, recently approved for use in certain countries for epilepsy it has varied uh, mechanism action modulation of intracellular uh, calcium via g protein coupled receptor 55 extra cellular calcium influx via transient receptor potential vanilla type 1 channels and adenosine uh, mediated signaling these are the broad uh, mechanism of actions of uh, enzyme i uh, mean med- anti seizure medications among uh, these uh, medications to know some uh, properties i will be discussing about the individual drugs uh, in further slides we have a uh, certain anti seizure medications which are enzyme inducers all these are all these points have important clinical applications phenytoin carbamazepine barbiturates ox carbamazepine and topiramate are all uh, enzyme inducers uh, again we know uh, the patently available drugs so coming to approach to an adult patient with seizures again it all starts from history uh, physical examination and you have to exclude all other possible uh, differential diagnosis most commonly syncope tia transient ischemic attack migraine or acute uh, psychosis and uh, now we have history uh, that is uh, if uh, okay if the patient presents with uh, seizures and uh, we have to the next step is whether Uh, there is the patient having a previous history of epilepsy or there is no history of epilepsy 
if there is no history of epilepsy then this is the first event we have to go with the basic laboratory investigations like complete blood count electrolytes including calcium magnesium uh, blood glucose level liver and renal function test urine analysis and even toxicology screening and if we find something positive uh, we treat it and if there is still uh, a doubt we uh, work up further including uh, ruling out cns infections with uh, lumbar puncture and the cultures or even imaging studies if required and we treat the underlying cause first and uh, we can consider anti seizure drug therapy after that uh, if the metabolic screening is normal then we go for uh, imaging but if it's negative uh, for the new onset epilepsy we go for imaging and eeg most commonly mri and eeg uh, from which we can have some idea about the underlying cause if still we are not able to identify the underlying cause we treat it as idiopathic seizure if there is structure abnormality abnormality like mass lesion stroke cns infection or any trauma related or degenerative disease related we treat it accordingly uh, on the other hand if the patient is presenting with uh, seizures and if there is a background history of seizure uh first thing we do is uh, whether he is on medications uh, is there any is the is the compliance good was the uh, drugs adequate uh, uh, what is the serum levels of the anti seizure medications was it associated with any side effects we have to assess all these backgrounds uh, if you find out uh, everything is okay and uh, still the cause is not known again we come back to Uh, metabolic uh, screening with the complete blood count electrolytes and uh, other routine investigations and if it is abnormal uh, we have to treat the identifying identifiable cause and then assess if it is normal uh, so um, mostly we will have sub therapeutic drug seizure level then we have to increase the dose or uh, still the patient is getting seizure then we have to escalate the therapy with um, a second line drug or an uh, add on uh, uh, drug uh, there comes the EEG. concept of uh, there comes the concept of refractory seizures so yes, patient is given one drug uh, he gets another seizure we have to rule always rule it whether the patient is taking the drug properly or not that's what adequacy and whether the particular drug is appropriate we are telling suppose patient is having a sodium channel disorder we cannot give any time or carbamazepine so that has to be assessed whether patient is taking any interfering medicine and we can confirm that by doing serum levels practically whether he is a patient with a known epilepsy disorder or not a known epilepsy disorder first always we have to rule out uh, the provocative factors i told you by doing a count which can rule out infection electrolyte sugar levels your analysis and toxicology for any patient but patient with a history of epilepsy always you have to rule out whether the drug is adequate or not suppose if all these are ruled out then try giving the drug in the maximum dose so we have two strategies for adding a drug suppose patient is on a particular dose of one drug either you can increase the dose of that drug or we can add another drug in the starting dose so the second approach is preferred by many because we are adding two drugs with the different mechanisms but their side effects don't add up uh, we call it refractory seizures when three appropriately chosen anti epileptics in full dose fails to control seizures that is called as refractory seizures okay three appropriately chosen anti epileptics in the maximum dose fails to control a seizure provided their drug levels uh, intake is adequate then we call it as refractory epilepsy then we have separate protocol called as the drugs for refractory epilepsy uh, we have brevaracetam parampenil these are some drugs for refractory epilepsy and surgery may be an option for refractory epilepsy okay so this is the left side which is given the right side is patient not a known history as is like first episode of seizure always rule out the provocating factors which we, we were telling you and uh, no provocating factor try to do an eeg and mri to find out any focal cause and try to find out what pattern of epilepsy and decide on treatment proceed um eeg 
basically eeg uh, measures the potential difference between uh, the pairs of electrodes on the scalp if it is a bipolar uh, or between individual scalp electrodes and a common uh, inactive uh, reference point which is called referential derivation which is amplified and displayed uh, the rhythmic activity normally recorded represents the post synaptic uh, potentials of vertically oriented pyramidal cells of the cerebral cortex and its characterized by its frequency uh, the cases of a normal eeg depends upon the patient's age and the level of arousal uh, ideally uh, eeg should be performed within 72 hours after the seizure uh, if we find the eeg is normal if the routine eeg is normal consider it as sleep deprived eeg to pick up changes if the routine and sleep deprived eeg is normal then we can go for ambulatory eeg which is up to 48 hours and uh, this is the mnemonic which i uh, came across for remembering the uh, waves the patient uh, bad strength of blood that is if the patient is awake and the eyes open we get uh, beta waves which are more than 30 hertz the patient is awake and eyes closed uh, he will have alpha waves ranging between 8 to 30 minutes in stage 1 uh, nrem sleep there will be theta waves between 4 to 7 hertz in stage 2 uh, nrem sleep uh, there will be spindle spikes and k complexes in stage 3 and stage 4 nrem sleep there will be delta waves which are less than 4 hertz and in rem sleep we have uh, beta waves I have another okay. thing for uh, the D tab. Like how to uh, remember the okay. frequency is D tab. B is delta, where the frequency is less than four. T for theta, where the frequency is four to seven. A is alpha, the frequency is eight to thirteen. More than thirteen is beta. More than fifty is gamma. D tab G. Okay, delta. Then comes theta. Then comes alpha. Then comes uh, uh, gamma. Like a beta, then gamma. Uh, Bastering blood. This may be useful to remember in which condition you get which one. Awake and eyes open beta. Awake and eyes close alpha. REM and non-REM what waves? Okay. Continue. Again, the absence of a electrographic electrographic seizure activity does not exclude a seizure disorder. However, because focal seizures may arise from a region of a cortex that cannot be detected by standard scalp electrodes provoking stimulus uh, to obtain uh, the eeg activity includes hyperventilation for 3 to 4 minutes or uh, any photic stimulation in both sleep and sleep deprivation uh, on the night prior to the recording can act as provoking stimulus and we can record the abnormal activity uh, epileptiform activity Uh, they are uh, bursts of abnormal discharges containing spikes or shock waves again the presence of epileptic form activity is not entirely specific for epilepsy but it has a much greater prevalence that the patient will uh, develop epilepsy than uh, patients without uh, epileptic form activities uh I can we all know eeg can help in establishing the diagnosis it can help us classify and localize and even predict the prognosis now there is something called a magnetoencephalography which measures the small magnetic fields that are generated by cortical activity these are analyzed and its sources in the brain uh, can be estimated by a variety of uh, mathematical techniques this uh, sources estimates uh, this source estimates can be plotted on an anatomical image of the brain such as mri so that we get a magnetic source image of the possible uh, cause of uh, seizure or the uh, lo- to localize the uh, seizurogenic uh, okay uh, moving on to neuroimaging mri epilepsy protocol should ideally be done within 6 weeks uh, of the mri referral if mri is contraindicated uh, then we can go for a ct scan but uh, if the patient presents with a seizure who is already a known uh, established epilepsy 
we our intuition will be to perform a ct scan in the pre but uh, unless you feel uh, ct will give us additional information uh, uh, we may not carry out a ct imaging uh, again mri or uh, other neuro imaging can be repeated if we if we find the original scan was suboptimal or there are uh, clinically new features to their epilepsy or they have idiopathic generalized epilepsy or self limited epilepsy with uh, centro temporal spikes that uh, has not responded to the first line treatment or repeat imaging can be considered if uh, if it is refractory and surgery is being considered uh, coming to genetic testing uh, whole genome sequencing for people with epilepsy of uh, unknown cause can be considered when uh, the age is less than 2 years when epilepsy started or the clinical features are suggestive of a specific uh, genetic epileptic syndrome like dravet syndrome or if the child is having some additional clinical features like a learning disability or autism spectrum disorder or a structural abnormality for example some associated congenital malformation is there or if there is unexplained cognitive or memory decline in the patient then we can Uh, go for a uh, genetic testing additional lab investigation uh, that can be performed includes a lumbar puncture which is uh, mandatory in all patients infected with hiv even in, in the absence of uh, symptoms or signs suggestive of cns infections and uh, testing for auto antibodies in the serum and uh, csf should be considered in patients presenting with a fulminant onset epilepsy associated with other abnormalities such as psychiatric symptoms or cognitive disturbances we want to differential diagnosis of seizures again all uh, different type of in one minute is more like so we'll create the next link and start one minute is less okay. than one minute is we'll restart